All right, so in this, this idea of examine how area underneath this and from B. All right, so what we'd like to do, as we've been doing in class, is to think about how to break this thing up into rectangles. And we've been using rectangles that always have the same width. But for the more general definition, the definite integral, that's not necessary. We don't have to always use uh, something that has the same width. What we really want to do is just take what we call a sample point and first define the heights of our rectangles instead of the widths. So for example, I might call this um, x1 star, and I want to use that for the height. All right, And then so I'll come over here and define this to be x2 star, and I'm going to make this the height of that rectangle, and then maybe over here, I'm not going to do too many here, just say x3 star, and we're going to make this the height. So then we have to think about, well, what would, be, what would the width be? And in the more, most general definition of the definite integral, it's not, there's no requirement that the, the width of these um, be the same. So we could just kind of say this is going to, if this is the height of my rectangle, I'm going to have my rectangle go like this. So here's my rectangle. And since this rectangle contains x1 star, this point here, I'll call it x1. And then for this one, for example, I might kind of come all the way over here and back to here. And since this rectangle contains x2 star, I'll call that x2. And here, if I'm coming up to the function here, then I'm going to go all the way over to b. And notice it doesn't have to be in the middle, right? It could be in the middle, it could be off to one side or the other. I'm just taking some sample point, and I'm using that function value as the height of my rectangle, and then I can let the width of the rectangles be whatever I want it to be. Um, so, you know, I have A, and then it goes to X1, and then to X2, and then to B. So we can kind of think of B as, as like X3, and A as like X0. Um, so the other thing I want to then think about is, is how would we define the, the width of this rectangle, all right? So we would call that delta x1, and I'm going to just define it to be x1 minus a. So that's the width of the first rectangle. The width of the second rectangle I'm going to call delta x2, and that's going to be x2 minus x1, and then the width of the third rectangle, I'm going to call it delta x3, and have that be x3 minus x2. So if we had a whole bunch of these rectangles, then we could say that delta xi is just xi minus x sub i minus 1, right? So this is one less than this, and it just gives us the width of the ith rectangle, right? This would be the first rectangle associated with x1, the second rectangle associated with x2, this would be the third rectangle. I guess technically this would be b, but we said we'd also be x3. So this gives us the width of our rectangles. What about the heights? Well, if this is f, then what we're taking as the height is the function value right here associated with x1 star, right? So the height would be f of x1 star. I just want to point out the reason I'm using this star notation is we're reserving the, the ones that don't have stars kind of our, our x values that are kind of the endpoints of our rectangles and the stars are just something inside the rectangle that we're using to get the height. So this one of course is f of x1 star, this one f of x2 star, and then the third one of course we're going to go to the function value associated with x3 star, so that's f of x3 star. Okay, so the area, all of these, if we wanted to estimate the area using these rectangles, we would have um, f of x1 star, the height, times delta x1, plus the height of the second one, f of uh, x2 star, times the width of that rectangle, delta x2, and then plus f of x three star times delta x three. And that would give us, you know, this area, this right here would represent this area, 
this one gives us that area, this one gives us that area. So if we had done a whole bunch of these, then we could use the, the this general form, right? So the height of the ith rectangle would be f of xi star, some sample point in the ith rectangle. And we take the function value associated with that to be the height of the rectangle. This is the width of the rectangle, all right? So in order to define, so the, the general form then here, uh, let me just introduce some notation here. Um, another shorter way of writing this is we use this summation notation, right? So we're going to let i equal 1 to 3 of f of x i star times delta x i. So what this means is basically this. First we let i equal 1, we have f of x1 star times delta x1, and then we add to that and we switch this index here to 2, so then we're adding f of x2 star plus delta x2, and then we switch it to 3, we stop at 3, whoops, we stop at 3 because that's what the limit is up here at the top of the, the kind of the, the end point of our summation, all right? So if we wanted to have kind of a, a more general one, we would have this idea here, if we just using the xi's, if we had n rectangles, then we would have from i equals 1 to n of f of xi star times delta xi. And so we can let n be any number. I just use 3 here because, well, you know, this is tedious enough just doing 3. But you get the idea. We can use as many rectangles as we want in here. So the definition, and this is my shorthand for definition, of the definite integral. So we're taking this. That's the integral sine from a to b of some function with respect to x. Notice these delta x's are kind of part of our definition, and as we let, so they basically become our dx, which is kind of a, a width of, a really small width, let's just put it that way, um, because this is ultimately a limit. We're, we're going to take the limit, so you remember the limit from calc 1, um, we're going to take the limit as the biggest, or we call it the max delta xi, all right? So in other words, the, the biggest of, in, I guess in this case, this would be probably the widest, right? We're looking at the widest rectangle. Of all of our rectangles, we take the max uh, width and we let it go to zero. So if we take that limit as the max width goes to zero, so that means, of course, more and more and more and more rectangles, then, and we take that, of that expression right there, i equals 1 to n f of xi star delta xi. So this is how we're defining it, which means that you know, we're, just, we're just saying this is what it is. Um, you can't really prove it because we're not trying to prove anything. We're just saying, well, this is what we mean. When we talk about this, we're talking about this, this idea that if we take the width, let the width of these go to zero, so that n is going to get larger and larger and larger, because then that makes us the smaller and smaller rectangles, at least in terms of the widths, then, then we get that exact area from a to b under the curve of f. Um, okay, so what types of functions are integrable? All right, so if there, we say the function is integrable if, if this holds for that function. Um, let's talk a little bit about what types. So this is a theorem. Um, which basically states that if f is continuous on some closed interval a, b, which actually continuity is, is stronger than we need. It doesn't have to be continuous. It could be continuous or if there are a finite number of discontinuities. And I should qualify that. Those would be um, either jump, um, jump discontinuities um, or The other type, not infinite discontinuities. Um, 
so they could be jump or like a hole, right? Where you just have kind of a hole, um, but not infinite discontinuities. Those those would create some problems. So um, basically, if the if the if there's a hole in the function or if it jumps, then those type of is refined of those types of discontinuities. Um, then f is integrable on a b. So this this previous thing, if that's true, then we know that this is true about f. That this limit will exist, right? Uh, we don't know. So if this limit exists, then we say f is integrable. Um, and what this is this theorem is telling us is that f, if f is continuous or it has a finite number of discontinuities in terms of like a, a hole or a jump, um, then that limit exists uh, for, for f. I just want to connect this back now to the work we've been doing with, um, so we've been using Rn, Ln, and Mn. And what, what we found with these, or what, what was common about these that's different from this more general definition that I just gave, is that here, the width of the rectangles were always the same, all right? So um, let me, let's, there's a theorem that kind of connects more to our intuition about, um, about the number of rectangles. So let me just state it and then I'll explain it. So f, if f is integrable on a, b, then we say this definite integral equals the limit as n goes to infinity of f of xi uh, delta x. All right, so again, this, this n is the same n we've been working with in class where we're talking about the number of rectangles. And this, I think, is a little bit uh, closer to our intuition um, in terms of the fact that when the number of rectangles goes to infinity, we, we end up with an exact area, which is what that is. So let's define what delta x is here and also what our x sub i is. So in this case, we mean that delta x is b minus a over n and um, that x sub i equals a plus i times delta x. So let's unpack that a little bit. So let's, let me just kind of give you an example. Let's see, we have something like a some kind of a decreasing function here and Again, what's, um, what we have here that we didn't have in the more general definition, this one, remember here, we didn't, the widths of our rectangles didn't have to be the same. And we were using any point. We didn't necessarily use always the left end point or the right end point or the midpoint. We just used some point in the rectangle, and these rectangles all had varying widths. Here, we're saying that if we take, if we go from, say, A to B, and we're going to divide it by and so let's just kind of divvy this up. Let's say that's one. Let's try to make them look about the same length. That's not very good, but let's just pretend. All right, so this is gonna be delta x. This is gonna be delta x. This is delta x. This is delta x. And even though I can't draw very well, we're gonna pretend that delta x is the same length in all, in all those cases. Um, so we've basically taken this and we've divided it up into one, two, three, four pieces, right? Okay, so what about these xi's? Where do those come from? Well, let's just use our definition here. So x1 would be a plus one times delta x, which is just delta x. Well, if I start with a, and then I add delta x, I'm right here. So there's x1. Now x2 would be a plus, so if this is two, then that's two, two times delta x. So if you start at a and go over two delta x's, now here's x, Two.